All right, so today I'm joined by Derek Jensen. Derek is the co-author of Deep Green Resistance, the author of Endgame, The Culture of Make-Believe, many other books, and a lifetime green activist. I guess you might call yourself uh, an advocate for non-human life. I don't know what label you'd use yourself, but yeah, it's great to be joined by you, Derek. Oh, thanks for having me. Yeah, you know, a lot of people actually that follow my channel will be familiar with you because I used um, I used a clip of you giving a lecture that's actually become uh, it became quite a viral clip. I've seen it in a lot of places uh, where you were doing the the queer theory jeopardy and uh, getting a surprisingly hostile reaction from your audience that day. But I, I was just wondering, like, you know, the LGBT stuff has has become kind of a hot button issue the last few years. I was wondering what kind of backlash you've got on on those kinds of issues specifically, because it seems like increasingly um, being out of lockstep with the left on social issues is uh, is not a good place to be in 2020. I mean, I think you mentioned off camera Graham Linnan, but I mean, he, he got in trouble. He's been in a lot of trouble recently because he said some things that uh, went against where where trans activism is at the minute. So. Yeah, I was just curious to hear what your experience is around that. Um, well, I would separate the backlash. There's no backlash really from LGB because um, a lot of a lot of gays and lesbians have been fighting the the T and the Q for a long time, decades, um, and the the backlash from the T and the Q has been. Uh, a surprise. Well, it's not surprise. It's not surprising because it happens to everybody. The the thing that that kind of blows me away is that I was raised a Seventh Day Adventist, which is a fundamentalist sect of Christianity, and the modern left is more dogmatic and doctrinaire than my experience of fundamentalist Christianity when I was a kid. Um, it's like before before one can express an opinion, or before I can express opinion. I, I've apologized publicly before because I expressed opinions without first running them past the Anarchist Central Committee. Um, or uh, I, I go back and forth between that one and running them past the uh, Anarchist uh, Synod of Bishops. Um, and it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. It would never occur to me, it has never occurred to me, there are people who write all sorts of stuff that I find utterly appalling. Um, either forget the writing's terrible; that's everywhere. Um, just politically appalling, and it would never occur to me to go to the publisher and try to get them unpublished. I want to I want to back up, and then then I'll talk more about the specific backlash that. Um, in the 1990s, Jerry Mander wrote this really good book called In the Absence of the Sacred. And Ward Churchill wrote an essay attacking the book. And I was friends with somebody who, who knew both of them, Jeanette Armstrong. She's an in Okanagan Indian writer and activist. And one day I said to, to Jeanette, so what did you think about Ward's essay attacking In the Absence of the Sacred? And she said, if Ward didn't like the book, he should write his own damn book. So, so that's my general philosophy, is if I don't like someone else's books, if I find their books morally repugnant, I'm going to write better books. And so far as the actual backlash, it started, well, it started before this, that there were a number of anarchists who decided they hated me about 15 years ago. And let's drop the personal reasons the the their stated reasons were uh, that because i believe that because i believe in organized resistance and i believe in forming organizations and working in organizations um therefore i must be a stalinist and um so they started coming after me 15 years ago. It's an absurd position. And it's one that that there's a really good essay written back in the oh gosh, late 80s, early 90s by Chaz Buffet, who's complaining about the same things. This is an older problem. 
anyway, um, so that's where I started. And that went on for about five years. Uh, lots of harassment. Um, um, they harassed my, my elderly, disabled, functionally blind mother. It's, it was all pretty, pretty uh, sorted. And then, um, and then we formed DGR and Deep Green Resistance. And at one point, the DGR was going to have a weekend conference, and uh, someone who, a male who identifies as transgender, wanted to uh, to show up at the event, and we said sure, and. Um, they said they wanted to sleep and shower with the women. And um, we said that wasn't going to happen. We said, you can wear your dress. We'll call you Julie. And, um, but the women have said that they don't want to sleep with you. And he immediately wrote, he immediately wrote back and told me that um, he hopes I die of Crohn's disease. And then uh, spread the news all around, and immediately we started receiving. Immediately we started receiving uh, death threats. The males, the females, received rape and death threats. Uh, they threatened to rape and murder the children of female DGR members. Um, so that was pretty much my introduction to that whole uh, movement, and it's it's been the same ever since, and it's the same for anybody who. Who does this? Um, and there have been people in DGR and outside of DGR too, who have lost their jobs. Um, I ultimately lost both of my publishers, not specifically about that, but because I dared to critique queer theory, which is uh, which can all, which one can only do evidently with the permission of the Pope of Anarchy. Um, I mean, I can give more details on any of this you want, or we can go some other direction. Whatever you want to do is is fine. I'm, I'm, I, feel, I realize that's a little bit, a little bit scattered, but I'm condensing ten years of harassment into thirty seconds. Well, I mean, you know, you're familiar with uh, an older brand of the left wing as well. I'm just wondering why you think that this has become such an important issue for them. I mean, the the left, the mainstream left now seems to care more about um, social issues than than economic justice or or anything really. Um, I'm just wondering, I mean, because I mean, you know, it's not immediately evident why uh, this kind of stuff is so attached to the left. I mean, it's uh, a lot of it comes from a kind of libertarian position, it seems to me like it's, you know, this idea that you kind of purchase a, a transient sort of consumer identity rather than um, static natural identities having any value. Yeah, I'm. I'm shaking my head, not at your analysis, but at the appalling nature of current reality. Um, that everything you're saying is is right on, and um, this, I think it's this Thursday, um, I am interviewing Diana Johnstone about exactly this issue. How did how did the left move from being? Uh, economically, you know, about the wor about working class people and and become toward toward this identity politics. It's, it's you know, uh, it's been coming for a long time. There's a, a few directions I want to go. One of them is that uh, for I'm 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 way too busy with books to write to get around to doing this one. But for 10 or 15 years, I've wanted to write a book about how neoliberalism has destroyed everything it's touched. And all the social movements it's touched, that neoliberalism has uh, destroyed environmentalism, it's destroyed anti-racist work, it's destroyed, that all that individualism that you're talking about has, has just devastated all these movements. And I found it extraordinary back in 2016 that the Democrats, a, a term that they were using for the 
for those who voted for Trump was the deplorables. And frankly, a lot of the people who were voting for Trump were blue collar people. And, and how did it happen that the party, well, we can talk about how it happened, but the party that at one point favored the working class, you know, Clinton pushed NAFTA, um, all these so-called free trade agreements that have just devastated working people both in the United States and around the world. And it's interesting to me how, you know, in 1998, the riots were about the WTO, and now the left will riot against those who oppose these international trade agreements that, you know, devastate working class people around the world. It's it's been a complete capture. And there's two more directions I want to go that I think um, apply to this. Unless, I mean, is this is this the direction you want me to go or do you want to, I mean, if you want to send me different directions, I will. No, I mean, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm happy to, I'm happy to hear about this. Okay, well, two other things that are really problematical. Oh, God. See, that's another word that's been destroyed, hasn't it? <laughs> um, two other things I don't like. One of them is um, postmodernism. And I've made this as a joke before, but it's really true. That postmodernism and queer theory both make me wonder at human sentience. Because they both take uh, absolutely brilliant ideas and then they take them in the stupidest possible direction. So postmodernism really sort of derived from the understanding that there are a lot of different narratives and there are different ways you can perceive reality. And, and these narratives can come in conflict and often the ones with more power end up pushing their narrative. So, you know, for 500 years, people in the United States have, for the most part, considered Columbus a hero. And there are those then who say, no, Columbus was a genocidal slaver. And that's a different narrative. And, and we can, we can have, for God's sake, we have this in sports. That's why you have instant replay, because you have one team thought the ball went over the line, the other team thought it didn't. And, and so postmodernism starts with that really important question of, we all know that the victors tell the history, and what does that mean about our understanding of history? And they take this great idea, and then somehow they end up having the worst possible answer, which is that there is no reality, there's only narratives. And that's, that's mind-bogglingly stupid. I mean, the understanding that, that you and I are, you know, we're in the same room and we're disagreeing as to who ate the last cookie on the plate. Well, the truth is that one of us did. And that's actual truth, no matter what stories we tell, no matter if, if, I am bigger than you, so I'm going to beat you up. Or if you are bigger than me, so you're going to beat me up. Or no matter what else, there is truth underneath it. And I, I don't know what to say about overpaid idiots at universities who, okay, it's like back when I was in, in getting my graduate degree, um, so 1990-ish, uh, there was a guy had an office next door to mine. He was a philosopher and he used to drive me nuts because when we'd get into any sort of discussion, he would always say that whales have no inherent value because humans are the only ones who assign value. And I mean, that's just, that's just absurd that whales, I mean, whales have ecological function. They have their own lives, et cetera, et cetera. And what I always daydreamed about doing whenever I would go in to talk to him is, and I never did this, of course, I would never do this, 
But I daydreamed about carrying in a hammer and smashing him in the thumb and saying, look, not getting smashed in the thumb has value no matter whether you believe it does or not. So you didn't create that value of not having your thumb hit by a hammer. It, it has inherent value. And I never did that. Anyway, so postmodernism is one thing I wanted to mention. Three things I want to mention. The other one, the next one is queer theory did the same thing. The queer theory asks a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant question. The queer theory is primarily about sex. And it asks a brilliant question, how did certain things become normalized? And how did certain things become uh, vilified, or, or that's not the right word, but become prescribed? And then it jumps to the conclusion that because homosexuality was uh, prescriptions against homosexuality are wrong, therefore all prescriptions against all form of sexuality are wrong. And that's just that's that's just idiotic. That's that's that doesn't follow logically. We have we have people who have PhDs and have written many books who don't understand that that does not follow a logic chain. It's just, it's stunning and horrifying to me. And I want to bring in one more person, then we'll go whatever direction you want. And the other person is, I, I'm not going to blame this on because I don't really believe in the great man theory of history, but we can take a lot of this back to um, Antisthenes. Antisthenes was a student of Plato. He's a student of one of them, I don't remember which. And if you recall, Plato had the idea that, um, that there are universal essences. And this is going to have a point, don't worry. Um, that there are, like there's a horse, and then there's also the essence of horse that's just out in the universe without any horse in it. And somebody else, I don't remember who, one of the, one of the big ones, had the, the the idea that I think is more realistic, which is you have a horse, which is the thing that has the essence of horse, but then there's no essence of horse, horse floating through the universe. You with me so far? Okay, so Antisthenes, his most famous line was, um, horse I can see, essence of horseness I cannot. And the point is, he believed that there was no there was no category horse even. All there are are a whole bunch of creatures who have four legs, hooves, eat hay, but there's no larger category whatsoever. And the, the way this ties into the, God damn it. Hello? Telephone salesperson. Um, the way this ties into everything else we're talking about is that the trans issue, a lot of identity politics is really in many ways based on Antisthenes that we are all, there is no larger social community. There is only, we can't call, we can't call you a man. We can't call me a man. We can't call that a horse. All there are are a bazillion different beings who may resemble each other, but there is no larger class interest. And this has been a fight going on for 2,500 years. So that's that's really, that's why I wanted to bring up the Antisthenes stuff, is that this is not, none of this is new. Sorry if we've gone too far in the thicket. Yeah, no, well, it's actually, it's, it's funny you bring this up, because I'm actually reading a book at the minute, um, The Theological Origins of Modernity. And it gets into this idea that um, modernity started with uh, the controversy around nominalism, because the, you know there was this scholastic worldview that um, everything was like a, you know, this kind of Platonic idea that the world was a, an emanation of the divine, and that um, every you know all being was kind of an expression of God's being, but that you had at the beginning of a lot of these modernist heresies when you had nominalism with people like William of Ockham who said that yeah there's no universals you know there's no hoarseness there's no 
there's no universal categories like uh, humanity or nature. Um, and yeah, as you say, what you're left with is this kind of atomism where it's a, uh, it's this chaotic flux. And uh, the book is quite interesting because he says that a lot of the a lot of the problems of modernity get traced back to this because then you get um, you get something like Renaissance humanism comes out of this. Um, he basically he says the two responses to this. One of them is humanism, and one of them was uh, the Reformation, which is just to you know, like absolute faith in God and like biblical literalism as a, as a way of like solving uh, some of the problems that this presents. Um, and it does seem to tie into what you said about the, you know, the the philosophy lecture and the whale, which is that the there is this kind of, you know, the postmodern way of thinking that it, it doesn't recognize, I guess, like intersubjective truths. I think Alfred Norris Whitehead, the philosopher, called it the, the fallacy of simple location. That if something can't be pinned down in space and time, that it doesn't exist. You know whether that's like the the value of of ecological diversity or um, any of the other categories we use to make sense of the world. So I mean, it seems like that these problems, like uh, because you know a lot of people will point to postmodernism. Like I think someone like Jordan Peterson does this, where he'll blame postmodernism, but he makes it sound like you know these things like liberalism and and the scientific worldview were fine until these crazy French literary theorists came along. But it, I think what it shows is that it's it's really a deeper problem in the whole the whole project of modernity and, and how we see the world and our place in it. So I love everything you're saying. And um, yeah, Antisthenes was very, very much a nominalist. Um, and he might even have been the first one. I don't know. I mean, the first one we know of. Um, oh, damn, why did I say that? Because there was something else I was going to ask you. Say the last thing you said again, please. Um, well, I think I mentioned uh, the idea, the fallacy of simple location. And this, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the thing I was going to ask you is, I had mentioned the great man theory of history, which I mm -hmm. don't really agree with for the most part, maybe in a few cases, Napoleon or something. But, you know, uh, we could argue. Anyway, so it seems we're in agreement on this, and I want to know what you think. My idea is generally that um, that postmodernism created Foucault as opposed to Foucault creating postmodernism. That the basically, and the same with rock and roll created Jimi Hendrix instead of Jimi Hendrix. And yeah, there's a, a back and forth, but but. Um, Philosophies move forward when they are well articulated, but they already they're not accepted if they don't jibe with what the culture is feeling anyway. Is that I mean, it's, can you say that better than I did? Did you see what I'm getting at? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I think I'd agree with that as well. Um, like I, I was actually talking to someone about modernism recently and, you know, the whole trend of of cosmopolitanism in the early 20th century and um you know this idea like this kind of nietzschean idea like life as as sort of artistic self-expression and um you know death of god and, and question and absolute values but yeah i mean that that's it's really part of, of of broader civilizational trends i mean if you look at something like you know what why did why you know why did feminism become acceptable in the early 20th century well you know they needed women in the factories or uh you know, a popular example that gets used is, um, you know, Edward Bernays was the nephew of Sigmund Freud, that the American companies hired him to encourage women to start smoking. And he he tied uh, he tied it to female liberation, that uh, smoking cigarettes was was a sign of the liberated woman. So, yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree with that. And as far as the you know, as far as the sort of new left, the postmodern left goes, I mean, we know that the, the CIA in the 1960s uh, supported the work of of people like Marcuse and and some of the Frankfurt School theorists and and um, and so, some of the new left thinkers of the time and that I mean we know now that the, the CIA was running um, the most prominent left wing journalists um, newspapers and magazines uh, in Europe at the time because they didn't want the the brand of the left in Europe to be uh, a working class movement to be a, a more you know, because obviously during the Cold War with the Soviet Union, they didn't want 
Soviet style socialism becoming popular anywhere in the world. So as part of the Cold War, they pushed these more, um, I guess, subversive leftist ideas that were more focused on on social liberation. Um, so yeah, I mean, I totally agree with that. You know, would would Marcuse have become as popular if if the, the U.S. didn't need to push a brand of leftism that um, matched perfectly with the with U.S. corporations' ability to uh, to sell people a, a libertarian social ideology and to um, fight off Russian communism? I don't think so. And we can see the same thing happening today. Um, I don't think necessarily through the CIA, but through the Rockefeller Brothers Foundation, Rockefeller Foundation, Ford Foundation, with the bright green response to climate change, where it's extraordinary to me how they've been able to convince us against all evidence that A, wind and solar can actually run an industrial economy, and B, wind and solar are not themselves tremendously ecologically harmful. And it's, uh, it's money, you know? And, and we don't need to get into this thicket, but the, the simply for propaganda, the trans movement has about 20 million a year that they can spend. It's just, it's tremendously well-funded. But that actually, that actually is going a different direction, though, because that's and I have some some very friendly, fun disagreements with a friend of mine over this who argues that it usually isn't primarily the money. Instead, it's usually the zeitgeist. And. Um, and I completely hear what you're saying about the CIA with Marcuse, et cetera, and. You know, money talks, as they say. But there's also there's also the the idea of um, so are you familiar with uh, with Mumford Lewis Mumford? He's a Marxist theorist, is he? I'm not no. I'm not too familiar with him. No, no, he was a he was a philosopher of cities, basically, and a philosopher of um, technology. Fabulous, fabulous stuff. Um, if you want to read only one thing of his, there's a maybe 10 page e essay called either authoritarian and democratic techniques or democratic and authoritarian techniques. I don't remember which. Um, anyway, he's interesting for a few reasons. One of them is very pro technology uh, in the 30s. And then World War Two changed his mind. And I find that. Both courageous and fascinating when someone who has written multiple books will go, you know what? I got new information and I was wrong. Um, anyway, so his basic idea was that uh, technologies don't emerge out of a vacuum. They emerge from a certain social structure. I mean, I'm sorry, they emerge, yeah, they, they emerge from certain social conditions will give rise to certain technologies. And then those technologies will then give rise to certain social systems so that uh, mining, for example, um, requires you to be able to force people into mine, it requires an authoritarian power structure. You're going to force people into mines. You have to steal the land the mine's going to be on. You have to uh, protect the ore. You have to protect the refined minerals. Um, so it requires a military and police system. And so that was his big deal. And I think of ideas kind of the same way that ideas emerge from certain social circumstances. I mean, this is nothing new. This is, what's that cliche about? Uh, I'm going to totally butcher this, but something like nothing so irresistible as a move, as a idea whose time has come or something that, um, yeah, I'm just, I'm just a. Okay, I want to, I want to go a slightly different direction. That, that. Something else that that for me fits into all this is that, you know, we have not talked, but I'm sure you've thought a lot about um, the sort of Carolyn Merchant's "The End of Nature" thesis, where the Industrial Revolution 
one of the things that happened was that uh, the social perception of nature changed from a uh, that of a living being to that of a machine with resources which we can remove. And by the way, Carolyn Merchant's book I think is really important, but never, ever, ever use any of her sources without following them back because I did that in a couple of books and it ends up she's wrong. Like Descartes never said some of the stuff she said he said. So just a little word there for your audience that, that it's a good book, really interesting book, but man, Descartes did not say half the stuff she said he did. Anyway, um, so that I think is, is really important analysis that when you convert your perception, you know, R.D. Lang's big, big realization was how you experience the world affects how you behave in the world. And if you experience the world as consisting of resources to be exploited, that's what you'll do. If you experience the world as consisting of other beings and in a relationship with, that's what you'll do. And that's all really interesting to me. And then um, my friend Lear Keith pointed out to me that this was the, that the heavy lifting had already been done by the Abrahamic religions, that what the Abrahamic religions did with their sky god is they removed meaning from the earth and deposited in this god way, way out there. And then all science did when it came along was turn out the light, you know? The, the heavy lifting of removing meaning from the redwood tree and from the Del Norte salamander and from the bear had all been been accomplished earlier where heaven is where the real action takes place somewhere else and and then um and then science came along and did the easy part my point being that science i think would have had a harder time doing this had it not already not already had had abrahamic monotheistic sky god religions not already paved the way for literally for several thousand years Yeah, I mean, again, it gets back to um, this idea of nominalism. I mean, the you know the modern scientific worldview really was was formulated by Francis Bacon. He was probably the first one to to really formulate it as like a totalizing worldview. But he was definitely, I mean, he he wrote himself on on William of Ockham and and nominalism. So that's that's a you know, again, it gets back to this sort of denial of denial of universals, denial of of anything except the flux of of matter but i guess i'm curious from your perspective then like if this is if it is a a crisis of thought i guess the question is how, how do you reverse something like that or how do you get out of that because it seems to me like even if industrial civilization collapsed tomorrow that if people are still you know if people still um look at a forest and see lumber or uh uh, look at a, a field of cattle and see meat that you're you're basically left with the same problem and it seems like you haven't really solved anything uh, even if if you've you've maybe given the earth some breeding space but yeah I mean if this is a, a crisis of thought that's kind of affecting the whole human species I mean how what what can we really do about that is there a way out of that so I was I was at this social change event 15 years ago that was their tagline was the shift is hitting the fan and I was like oh and the reason I was making that face is because um, that's not how real social change takes place I don't think um, Peggy Reef Sanday did a cross-cultural study on why some cultures are high rape and some cultures are low rape and among indigenous peoples and some of the things were pretty obvious some of the characteristics like if it if the culture devalues women it's probably high rape you know makes sense if it's highly militarized it's probably high rape and all of those are most of those are pretty much what we'd expect one of the interesting ones was 
if there is a male creator deity versus a couple creator deity or a female creator deity, it's probably high rape. That's pretty interesting because having a male creator deity is pretty counterintuitive. Um, anyway, leaving all that aside, the one I wanted to get to is that if there was a history of ecological dislocation in the last several hundred years, it was probably a high rape culture. Okay, that's what she said, and now I'm going to extrapolate. What that means to me is two things. One of them is that uh, when, when a culture is stressed, men often take it out on women. But the real point I want to make, having to do with this conversation here, and I told you this whole long story just for this point, is that it takes three or four hundred years to metabolize a trauma culturally. I think it takes three or four hundred years. It takes ten generations, fifteen generations, however long that is, to to change one's story significantly enough to root out, to metabolize that trauma and to return to a state of normalcy. So the bad news is, I mean, sure, we can we can mobilize pretty quickly and we can organize pretty quickly, but in order to, I mean, how many hundred years did it take for the enlightenment to shake the control of the church? You know, this is, that's not a slow, and yeah, we can talk about processes going more quickly maybe with hot, with modern technology, but that would be an interesting discussion in and of itself about what, what ideas change and how knowledge changes that way and whether those are actually good or bad for humanity. That would be a really interesting discussion too. But my point is that, that society changes, I think, very slowly over many generations as the stories slowly change. And, and one example I think about with this is, you know, you have the, the end of chattel slavery in the United States in the 1860s with the American Civil War, but that didn't change the underlying problems. So there was still this imperative to own black, black bodies, black time. And so they came up with all of the, the, the Jim Crow and the penal system. So the, the form, it's like, Okay, I'm going to go a different direction completely. When the United States in the 19, late 60s and the early 70s, when the United States got really serious about interdicting the flow of marijuana from Mexico um, by spraying Paraquat, by tightening up the border, it didn't actually decrease the amount of pot smoked in the United States. It moved the source from Mexico to Jamaica, Colombia, and then Northern California. And it's what one uh, marijuana scholar calls uh, the balloon effect, where if you push in on the balloon in one place, it spreads out in another. So that happened with racism. It certainly happened with sexism that 100 years ago, women were fighting for bathrooms, to have their own bathrooms, so that they could have a more public life, a robust public life. And they succeeded after decades of struggle and you know they have struggled for other rights they struggled for decades for title 9 and and women's sports and so the threat to women's sports of just repealing title 9 is over but the underlying hatred of women is still there and it's got to come out in a new way and it's coming out in in destroying women's sports through trans activism etc and so what I'm getting at is that if you have, is that yes, we can, we can, it's necessary, important and necessary, getting rid of chattel slavery was a good thing, but that by itself didn't solve the problem. Do you see what I'm trying to get at? Yeah, I guess I'm just wondering, like, do you think, you know, a lot of the a lot of the environmentalist movement takes on um, kinds of of neo paganism as a way to kind of 
re-enchant the world. But I mean, it does seem like that the problem that a lot of environmentalists have identified is this disenchantment of the world and this sort of um, instrumental reason where we're we're uh, you know we're reducing life to means rather than ends in themselves. But I guess there's a question of is that such a fundamental issue in in how we conceive the world that it can be solved by something you know is it a question like that heidegger said that only a god can save us now like do you need some kind of uh reinvigorated like neo-paganism or or spirituality or, or some kind of traditionalist worldview that returns to seeing the cosmos as an emanation of of the divine of the transcendent or or is this something that you think can be achieved more piecemeal by kind of winning people's hearts and minds well first off i want to just thank you for asking really intelligent questions and um one of the reasons that perhaps my performance in this interview has been mediocre is that there is an optimum is that when I get asked questions I've been asked a million times before, I always have really good answers because I've answered the question 50 times before. But when people ask me fairly new questions, I'm as stupid as everybody else. And so you've asked me some really great and challenging questions. So I've just been, and so I'll come up with great answers for you in six months, you know? <laughs> um, you know how that works. Anyway, um, it's, I think it's all, as you were saying all that, I was thinking a couple things. One is, yes, I think a new religion would be really helpful. Unfortunately, the new religion we're getting is SJW, um, is nominalism, frankly. Um, but yes, a, a, an enchantment of the world. But part of the problem is that is how many wild animals do you have a daily relationship with? I'm not trying to put you on the spot because I don't have a relationship with very many. It's not a rhetorical question. Yeah, but for me, it's, it's, it's zero. And how many machines do you have a daily relationship with? Probably. Using relationship, obviously, in a sort of disgusting manner. Probably over over a dozen anyway, I'd say. Yeah. And what percentage of your and of course I'm not talking about you, I'm talking about me too. It's all of us. What percentage of your perceptions are created by or mediated by humans as opposed to coming directly from you know, wind in the trees would not be mediated by humans, unless it's on YouTube. Mm. And and how many corporate jingles do you recognize versus how many bird songs? And then there's another problem too, which is if, if your food comes from the grocery store and your water comes from the tap, then you're going to defend to the death the system that brings those to you because your life depends on it. And if your food comes from a land base and your water comes from a river, you'll defend to the death those because your life depends on it. But the problem is it's our direct experience. It's not how you think about it. And you recognize, oh yeah, this food actually did come from a land base. That's not your experience. Your experience is I went down to Safeway or Tesco or wherever and bought it. And the problem is that we can have a religion, but how we, and I'm not at all suggesting, oh, what this means is you and I both need to go huddle in the forest and never use a machine and also, you know, eat roly polies and not go to the grocery store. Because that won't change, personal change doesn't equal societal change. My point is that um is that there was a study done in the uk a few years ago they asked 
people, I don't remember what age, like 15 to 30 or 15 to 25 or something, what they thought was more important between sunlight and Wi-Fi. And Wi-Fi was the overwhelming favorite. And as of course, completely appalling, but it also makes perfect sense because they use the Wi-Fi every day and they got to check in with their friends and they got to see who won the latest soccer match or whatever. And sun is just backdrop. And this is, sorry, I'm, I'm just rambling, but this, this is, this is an important thing in literature too, that, um, almost all literature, the land, is not another character, but is the stage upon which the human play is told. And it's, my point is that this devaluing of the natural world is really deep, and it's also functional in this way of life. And I just want to add that that this is abusers know this person abusers on a personal sense know this that if if some guy is abusive and he he gets a part my mom the first time she was beaten was when she was pregnant and this is in the fifties and um, this is not infrequent where they wait until she is dependent you know she can't uh, her options for leaving and what would have happened if on the first date he would have beat her up it's like god i'm not sticking around for this but he waited until he had some control over her and this happens all the time where you exert economic control and you're able to do what you want and there was an 1830s pro-slavery philosopher in the united states who wrote to his northern abolitionist buddy saying we would free the slaves in a heartbeat if we could arrange the land ownership conditions such that it would be optimal for us because there are land ownership conditions in which landowners need to own the slaves, the capitalists need to own the slaves, and land ownership conditions in which it's in their best interest not to. It's very simple. If there's a lot of land and not many people, that means people have access to land, which means they have access to food, clothing, and shelter, which means they have access to self-sufficiency. And the only way you can get them to work for you is to point of a gun. If, on the other hand, you got people living in a city or people living such that they don't have access to land for whatever reason, that means that they don't have access to land, which means they don't have access to food, clothing, and shelter, which means they don't have access to self-sufficiency, which means they have to work for you for whatever pittance, which actually, from the capitalist interests, is a much more profitable way to own a person than to have to take care of them when they're sick and old. And my point being, that that a simple statement of how often do we spend time outside too or on what do we depend ends up having all sorts of hum huge ramifications that's part of the problem is that the system is so seamless that um it gets us from you know every direction I hope this is making some sense. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I was wondering, maybe this ties into it, but I was wondering, I mean, the, you know, the last few years, it does seem like um, environmental issues have taken more center stage in, in politics and in discussion of our future, especially around climate change. Um, but, you know, you mentioned earlier, like the solar and wind energy being distractions really i don't know if you saw this year or last year there was a documentary out um planet of the humans that discussed this yeah he and i become friends Je jeff gibbs okay yeah so I, I was just wondering like do, do you find any optimism in that that you know people like greta thunberg and all these people are being mainstreamed or is this just more sort of distraction it's just just a, another scheme by the capitalists and this time they're just using environmentalism as they're as they're buying well it's really problematical because gosh, there's that word it's really uh something 
that it, uh, I am profoundly grateful to Bill McKibben et al for working tirelessly to raise awareness about global warming. That is fantastic. Unfortunately, the solutions being offered are simply wrong. And, you know, I can go like whole days with the, without the phone ringing. Hello? Um, who's this? You know, can you take me na my name off your list? Thanks. Um, anyway, um, I think that the, the raising awareness about global warming is, is really important. The problem is that what has effectively happened, I mean, the solutions won't work. The solutions they present won't work. They don't help the planet. The planet does not need more industrial energy. And so it has basically what is effective. If you ask, if there's a million people marching in the streets of Paris and you ask them, why are you marching? They will say to protect the environment. And if you say, so what are your demands? They will say, we want more more subsidies for the wind and solar industries. So what has effectively happened has this crisis has been used to turn a movement into a lobbying arm for a sector of industrial capitalism. And at one point, environmentalism was about saving wild places and wild beings. And that has been transformed. Bill McKibben is explicit. He's trying to save civilization. He's not trying to save the planet. Naomi Klein's very specific. She says, polar bears don't do it for her. It's all about us. Those are direct quotes. There are so many who say, um, you've got Lester Brown with plan B 4.70 to save civilization. You know, I'll bet that coral reefs and polar bears and koala bears wish that that sentence would have ended differently. And um, so what it's been done I mean, effectively, those, those in, in the oil industry understand peak oil, and they understand that oil, oil is, is not infinite, and they understand that there needs to be replacements insofar as they can, they're, they're, but they're not replacements, I'll say why in a second. There, there need to be new forms of energy found. And those are incredibly expensive. And how do you get the public to pay for it? It's just Naomi Klein's shock doctrine. You say the world is going to end unless you give us a lot of money for wind and solar. And here's the thing that really blows all this stuff apart is that over the last several thousand years, humans have used increasing amounts of energy and excluding human and non-human slavery, you know, you've got wood and then you've got coal and i don't know the exact order but we'll go wood coal uh oil hydro uh nuclear back in the 40s 50s um i'm missing some big ones natural gas anyway the point is each one of these forms of energy has not substituted out the old ones it's added on and so there's actually more wood burned for energy today than there was in 1850, even though there's all these other sources. And this is all something that if somebody's going to understand the modern climate change movement and why, they're, why they will never help the planet, one of the things we under, need to understand is called the Jevons Paradox. And the Jevons Paradox, Jevons was an economist in the 19th century who studied coal. And what he found was that increases in coal efficiency, efficiency of coal use, did not in fact lead to decreased use of coal. Like you'd think, you know, if you can use coal twice as efficiently, well, you only need to use half as much to heat your house. But instead, 
what that meant was that personal and industrial use expanded. So increased efficiency in coal use actually increased coal use. And a, a great example, I live in Northern California and Northern California is known for marijuana country. And so an example I always use is, so let's say somebody grows, you know, grow of a certain size and you're making a small living and your electric bill is a thousand bucks a month and uh, you make enough profit to make 30,000 a year. Well, suddenly they come out with a new bulb that's half as expensive. Either A, you can now keep $500 a month more profit and do something, you know, buy, buy land or something with it. Or you could double the size of your grow and instead of making 30,000 a year, you make 60,000 a year. And that's what capitalism does. And so every new form of energy that comes online does not replace old forms, it just adds on top, which is the last thing the world needs. Yeah, I, th I think there's a there's a similar paradox called uh, it's like the office paper paradox. It's like um, you know, since the the introduction of of computers and and everything uh, being turned, uh, you know, using technology for everything in office spaces, that uh, the amount of paper used in offices has actually like doubled since the eighties. You know, you'd think that it'd be it'd be made redundant by by all the technology, but uh, for whatever reason, yeah, it doesn't become redundant. But they actually use more of it, so it's uh, kind of a similar paradox. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'd actually be interested if you'd like to expand on um, why wind and solar energy aren't as as much of a solution as people might think they're. Uh, because I, I do, I mean, I think a lot of people were kind of surprised at that documentary. A lot of people like wind energy is often presented as no downsides you know you just build as many windmills as you want and have unlimited energy but it isn't quite like that is it yeah first off we need to start thinking that i mean wind turbines don't they're not fruit of the wind turbine tree um, they require mining they require um mining of rare earths iron copper um they require all of which require fossil fuels, um, they're incredibly dirty to, to manufacture. Uh, when they are at the end of their usable period, um, much of the materials are made of, say, compound plastics, which are effectively not recyclable. Um, and then there are the numbers, if you, if you want, I can find the numbers on them. They, they kill lots of bats and birds. And uh, this is one of the things that breaks my heart, is that um, if you say they kill lots of bats and birds, there are environmentalists who will say, yeah, but they don't kill as many as skyscrapers or cats. And this breaks my heart because this reveals a lack of care for that wild creature because for the, for those species because let's say you're suffering from let's say you've got three opportunistic diseases that are ravaging your body and now in addition you get a staph infection i mean is somebody going to say don't worry about the staph infection you've got these other three things killing you the fact that you've got other things killing you is all the more reason not to add burden and, and we would understand that, we do understand that in our own lives and the lives of those we love. Um, but there are other problems too. One is the intermittency that uh, wind and solar only produce uh, AC electricity and AC electricity can't be stored. I mean, it, just, it can't. It's, and it can be converted to DC and stored in a battery it can be used to heat something up. It can be used to pump water, which is the primary way that they they store the energy is is dams, which are incredibly environmentally destructive. Um, and then you pump the water up when you're when you've got the the wind blowing, and then you you run it down through turbines when you when you don't when the wind isn't blowing. And and also there are they just lie. They, they just it, it kills me how how openly they lie. Like they will say, Munich agreed to go 100% renewable energy. 
or Los Angeles is going to go 100% renewable energy. And that's not what they mean. What they mean is LA is going to try to go 100% quote renewable end quote um, electricity. But electricity is only 20% of energy use. 80% of energy use is transportation, is um, heating a big building through oil burners. Um, so, and it's no big deal. You know, if, if, if your mother or if the, a neurosurgeon or a cricket player misuses electricity and energy in that way, that's fine. I'm not that much of a pedant. But when somebody who is proposing policy says that Munich is going to 100% renewable energy and they mean 20% renewable energy, that's, and besides which, most of that renewable energy is from cutting down forests and burning them um, for biomass. Um, yeah, so the, the results are actually incredibly expensive for very little. There are things that people could do that would be much, much better for uh, stopping the carbon problem. Um, some of the examples, we have a book coming out next year called Bright Green Lies that details this in 600 pages or 500 pages. And some of the solutions we present include things like uh, restoring prairies, grasslands, um, restoring uh, um, salt marshes, uh, mangrove swamps, uh, seagrass beds, because they all, they all uh, can store peat bogs. They can all store incredible amounts of carbon and there could be some miraculous things done if people cared about actually saving nature um, and it wouldn't have it would not have the downside of creating all these toxic materials all right um yeah we can wrap up soon enough but just on that you know um do you put stock in in the idea that there are technologies that can help us get away out of this uh you know, you mentioned some solutions there, but even, you know, people talk about things like, um, you know, algae farming or thorium reactors, all these kinds of things get thrown around. But um, do you think that this is just the same problem that we're constantly looking for? Uh, we're constantly looking for a, a technological solution to a technological problem and that, you know, we're not going far enough? Um, yes. Um, there the primary problem is that all of these solutions take industrial capitalism as a given and the natural world is having to conform to industrial capitalism. And that's literally insane in terms of being out of touch with physical reality. Um, because the planet must be primary because without a planet you don't have any social system whatsoever. So. So the, the questions I always ask are, what are best for the land? What are best for the blue whales? What are best for the desert tortoises? What are best for the gopher tortoises? What are best for the Scottish wildcats? Um, Scottish wildcats, there's 35 left in the wild, 25 or 35, and their habitat is going to be destroyed for a wind farm, a wind energy harvesting facility. Um, and this all reminds me of the famous saying from Vietnam about destroying the village to save it. And it's uh, so no, I, I don't, I don't, I did come up many years ago. I came up in an essay. I came up with a, a, um, a techno solution to all of our problems, uh, which if you've read much of my work, you know that that's extraordinary for me to come up with a techno solution to the problem, but it's very simple. It's a remote controlled cigar cutter. And what you do is when somebody puts in some new project and says, this is not going to harm anything, then you say, sure, you can put it in. Like they say, they're going to put in an oil well that won't leak. Great, you can do that. But um, for the entire duration of the project, we're going to attach remote controlled cigar cutters to your genitals. And if the project does in fact leak, or if it doesn't cause an increase in cancer, or if you know the 
the super safe new tanker does do an oil spill, but give them some skin in the game. Um, I'm not entirely serious with that, of course. <laughs> but the point is that we, um, is that, no, I don't think that there are techno fixes to this. I think that nature has evolved to, uh, to be much smarter than we are. And I would trust nature for solutions. All right. Um, just one last question before we finish. Um, Penty Linkola died this year. Were you familiar with him? You know, I've heard the name, um, but no, I, I can't say I'm familiar with him. Yeah, and also, um, I don't think I've seen you discuss uh, Ted Kaczynski, but I mean, like, how, how do you rate him in terms of the, the critiques he made? Do you see any value in, in some of the work that he made? Well, I don't think he's wrong in terms of technology being highly alienating. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not a big fan of mail bombs, um, but I think a lot of his analysis of technology's effect on nature and society was, uh, is, is analysis that needs to be out there. I, I think that there, there are, uh, there have been very intelligent critics of technology who have been warning us about it for for a long time. I interviewed Robert J. Lifton in in the nineteen in the nineties, and he uh, one of the questions he, he's the world's foremost authority on the psychology of genocide. And one of the questions I asked him was, uh, "Does technology exacerbate?" the sort of mind splitting that takes place that allows someone to be a good a good family man and at the same time run a death camp. And he laughed and said, technology exacerbates everything. And my point being that you don't need to be Ted Kaczynski to understand that technology is uh, not really doing us or the world any favors.